Chapter 14 of The Sleeper Awakes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Nat Johnson. The Sleeper Awakes by H. G. Wells. Chapter 14. From the Crow's Nest. And so, after strange delays, and through an avenue of doubt and battle, this man from the nineteenth century came at last to his position at the head of that complex world. At first, when he rose from the long, deep sleep that followed his rescue and the surrender of the council, he did not recognize his surroundings. By an effort he gained a clue in his mind, and all that had happened came back to him at first with a quality of insincerity, like a story heard, like something read out of a book. And even before his memories were clear, the exultation of his escape, the wonder of his prominence, were back in his mind. He was the owner of the world, master of the earth. This new great age was in the completest sense his. He no longer hoped to discover his experience as a dream. He became anxious now to convince himself that they were real." An obsequious valet assisted him to dress under the direction of a dignified chief attendant, a little man whose face proclaimed him Japanese, albeit he spoke English like an Englishman. From the latter he learnt something of the state of affairs. Already the revolution was an accepted fact. Already business was being resumed throughout the city. Abroad the downfall of the council had been received for the most part with delight. Nowhere was the council popular, and the thousand cities of Western America, after two hundred years still jealous of New York, London, and the East, had risen almost unanimously two days before at the news of Graham's imprisonment. Paris was fighting within itself. The rest of the world hung in suspense. While he was breaking his fast, the sound of a telephone bell jetted from a corner, and his chief attendant calls his attention to the voice of Ostrog making polite inquiries. Graham interrupted his refreshment to reply. Very shortly, Lincoln arrived, and Graham at once expressed a strong desire to talk to people and to be shown more of the new life that was opening before him. Lincoln informed him that in three hours' time a representative gathering of officials and their wives would be held in the state apartments of the Windvane chief. Graham's desire to traverse the ways of the city was, however, at present impossible because of the enormous excitement of the people. It was, however, quite possible for him to take a bird's-eye view of the city from the crow's nest of the Windvane keeper. To this Graham was conducted by his attendant Lincoln, with a graceful compliment to the attendant, apologized for not accompanying them on account of the present pressure of administrative work. Higher even than the most gigantic windwheels hung this crow's nest, a clear thousand feet above the roofs, a little disc-shaped speck on a spear of metallic filigree, cable-stayed. To its summit Graham was drawn in a little wire-hung cradle. Halfway down the frail-seeming stem was a light gallery, about which hung a cluster of tubes. Minute they looked from above, rotating slowly on the ring of its outer rail. They were specula, on rapport with the wind vane keeper's mirrors, in one of which Ostrog had shown him the coming of his rule. His Japanese attendant ascended before him, and they spent nearly an hour asking and answering questions. It was a day full of the promise and quality of spring. The touch of the wind warmed, the sky was an intense blue, and the vast expanse of London shone, dazzling under the morning sun. The air was clear of smoke and haze, sweet as the air of a mountain glen. Save for the irregular ovals of ruins about the House of Council and the black flag of the surrender that flew there, the mighty city seen from above showed few signs of the swift revolution that had, to his imagination, in one night and one day, changed the destinies of the world. A multitude of people still swarmed over these ruins, and the huge open-work stagings in the distance from which started in times of peace the service of aeroplanes to the great cities of Europe and America were also black with the victors. Across a narrow way of planking, raised on trestles that crossed the ruins, a crowd of workmen were busy restoring the connection between the cables and wires of the council house and the rest of the city, preparatory to the transfer thither of Ostrog's headquarters from the Windvane buildings. For the rest, the luminous expanse was undisturbed. So vast was its serenity in comparison with the areas of disturbance that presently Graham, looking beyond them, 
could almost forget the thousands of men lying out of sight in the artificial glare within the quasi-subterranean labyrinth, dead or dying of the overnight wounds, forget the improvised wards with the hosts of surgeons, nurses, and bearers feverishly busy, forget, indeed, all the wonder, consternation, and novelty under the electric lights. Down there in the hidden ways of the anthill, he knew that the revolution triumphed, that black everywhere carried the day, black favors, black banners, black festoons across the streets. And out here, under the fresh sunlight, beyond the crater of the fight, as if nothing had happened to the earth, the forest of wind vanes that had grown from one or two while the council had ruled roared peacefully upon their incessant duty. Far away, spiked, jagged, and indented by the wind vanes, the Surrey hills rose blue and faint. To the north and nearer, the sharp contours of Highgate and Muswell Hill were similarly jagged, and all over the countryside he knew, on every crest and hill, where once the hedges had interlaced, and cottages, churches, inns, and farmhouses had nestled among their trees, wind-wheels similar to those he saw, and bearing like them vast advertisements, gaunt and distinctive symbols of the new age, cast their whirling shadows, and stored incessantly the energy that flowed away incessantly through all the arteries of the city. And underneath these wandered the countless flocks and herds of the British Food Trust, his property, with their lonely guards and keepers. Not a familiar outline anywhere broke the cluster of gigantic shapes below. St. Paul's, he knew, survived, and many of the old buildings in Westminster, embedded out of sight, arched over, and covered in among the giant growths of this great age. The Thames, too, made no fall and gleam of silver to break the wilderness of the city. The thirsty water mains drank up every drop of its waters before they reached the walls. Its bed and estuary, scoured and sunken, was now a canal of sea water, and a race of grimy bargemen brought the heavy materials of trade from the pool thereby beneath the very feet of the workers. Faint and dim in the eastward between earth and sky hung the clustering masts of the colossal shipping in the pool. For all the heavy traffic, for which there was no need of haste, came in gigantic sailing ships from the ends of the earth, and the heavy goods, for which there was urgency, in mechanical ships of a smaller, swifter sort. And to the south, over the hills, came vast aqueducts with seawater for the sewers, and in three separate directions ran pallid lines, the road stippled with moving grey specks. On the first occasion that offered, he was determined to go out and see these roads. They would come after the flying ship he was presently to try. His attendant officer described them as a pair of gently curving surfaces a hundred yards wide, each one for the traffic going in one direction, and made of a substance called edomite, an artificial substance, so far as he could gather, resembling toughened glass. Along this shot a strange traffic of narrow rubber-shod vehicles, great single wheels, two- and four-wheeled vehicles, sweeping along at velocities of from one to six miles a minute. Railroads had vanished. A few embankments remained as rust-crowned trenches here and there. Some few formed the cores of Edomite ways. Among the first things to strike his attention had been the great fleets of advertisement balloons and kites that receded in irregular vistas northward and southward along the lines of the aeroplane journeys. No great aeroplanes were to be seen. Their passages had ceased and only one little seeming monoplane circled high in the blue distance above the Surrey Hills, an unimpressive soaring speck. A thing Graham had already learnt, and which he found very hard to imagine, was that nearly all the towns in the country, and almost all the villages, had disappeared. Here and there only, he understood, some gigantic hotel-like edifice stood amid square miles of some single cultivation, and preserved the name of a town, as a Bournemouth, Wareham, or Swanage. Yet the officer had speedily convinced him how inevitable such a change had been. The old order had dotted the countryside with farmhouses, and every two or three miles was the ruling landlord's estate, and the place of the inn and cobbler, the grocery shop and the church, the village. Every eight miles or so was the country town, where lawyer, corn merchant, wood stapler, saddler, veterinary surgeon, doctor, draper, milliner, and so forth, lived. Every eight miles, simply because that eight-mile marketing journey, 
four there and back, was as much as was comfortable for the farmer. But directly the railways came into play, and after them the light railways, and all the swift new motor cars that had replaced wagons and horses, and so soon as the high roads began to be made of wood and rubber and Edomite and all sorts of elastic durable substances, the necessity for having such frequent market towns disappeared. And the big towns grew. They drew the worker with the gravitational force of seemingly endless work, the employer with their suggestion of an infinite ocean of labor. As the standard of comfort rose, as the complexity of the mechanism of living increased, life in the country had become more and more costly, or narrow and impossible. The disappearance of vicar and squire, the extinction of the general practitioner by the city specialist, had robbed the village of its last touch of culture. After telephone, kinematograph, and phonograph had replaced newspaper, book, schoolmaster, and letter, to live outside the range of the electric cables was to live an isolated savage. In the country there were neither means of being clothed nor fed, according to the refined conceptions of the time, no efficient doctors for an emergency, no company, and no pursuits. Moreover, mechanical appliances in agriculture made one engineer the equivalent of thirty laborers. So, inverting the condition of the city clerk in the days when London was scarce inhabitable because of the coaly foulness of its airs, the laborers now came to the city and its life and delights at night to leave it again in the morning. The city had swallowed up humanity. Man had entered upon a new stage in his development. First had come the nomad, the hunter, then had followed the agriculturalist of the agricultural state, whose towns and cities and ports were but the headquarters and markets of the countryside. And now, logical consequence of an epoch of invention was this huge new aggregation of men. Such things as these, simple statements of fact, though they were to contemporary men, strained Graham's imagination to picture. And when he glanced over beyond there, at the strange things that existed on the continent, it failed him altogether. He had a vision of city beyond city, cities on great plains, cities beside great rivers, vast cities along the sea margin, cities girdled by snowy mountains. Over a great part of the earth the English tongue was spoken, taken together with its Spanish-American and Hindu and Negro and Pidgin dialects, it was the everyday language of two-thirds of humanity. On the continent, save as remote and curious survivals, three other languages alone held sway. German, which reached to Antioch and Genoa, and jostled Spanish-English at Cadiz, a Gallicized Russian, which met the Indian English in Persia and Kurdistan, and the Pigeon English in Peking, and French, still clear and brilliant, the language of lucidity, which shared the Mediterranean with the Indian English and German, and reached through a Negro dialect to the Congo. And everywhere now, through the city-set earth, save in the administered Black Belt territories of the tropics, the same cosmopolitan social organization prevailed, and everywhere, from pole to equator, his property and his responsibilities extended. The whole world was civilized. The whole world dwelt in cities. The whole world was his property. Out of the dim southwest, Glittering and strange, voluptuous and in some ways terrible, shone those pleasure cities of which the chematograph phonograph and the old man in the street had spoken. Strange places, reminiscent of the legendary Sybaris, cities of art and beauty, mercenary art and mercenary beauty, sterile, wonderful cities of motion and music, whither repaired all who profited by the fierce, inglorious economic struggle that went on in the glaring labyrinth below. Fierce, he knew it was. How fierce he could judge from the fact that these latter-day people referred back to the England of the nineteenth century as the figure of an idyllic, easy-going life. He turned his eyes to the scene immediately before him again, trying to conceive the big factories of that intricate maze. Thus concludes Chapter 14 of The Sleeper Awakes by H. G. Wells, read by Nat Johnson, Rockport, Massachusetts.